Welcome to How Ethical Leadership is the Key to Sustained Success in Business. I'm your host, Dr. Bruce Weinstein, the ethics guy and Forbes contributor. Today's webinar is a partnership between the Carnegie, Carnegie Council for Ethics in International Affairs and my own company, the Ethics Guy LLC. And it's brought to you by the Carnegie Council, the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants and the CFA Institute. You may be familiar with the columns I've written and continue to write for Forbes on ethical leadership. And my most recent books are Ethical Intelligence, Five Principles for Untangling Your Toughest Problems at Work and Beyond, and The Good Ones, 10 Crucial Qualities of High Character Employees. I also have a book for teens and tweens called, Is It Still Cheating If I Don't Get Caught? And uh, that usually gets, for some reason, that gets a laugh. Uh, unfortunately, that idea is timely for children and, and adults. But uh, without further ado, I'm pleased to uh, introduce to you our distinguished, very distinguished panel. We have Carol Tate, who is Director of Global Ethics and Compliance and Associate General Director at the Intel Corporation in Santa Clara, California. She has served as Senior Counsel at the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission and received a JD from Boston College Law School. Terry Civitello is Associate Director of Ethics and Compliance for the Otis Elevator Company, an industry leader in the manufacturing and servicing of elevators, escalators, and moving walkways. She joined Otis 20 years ago and understands the value of awareness training and ethical leadership in a global marketplace. And we have Mike Valentine, who is president and CEO, CEO of Baxter Credit Union, a credit union that partners with America's best workplaces to improve the financial well being of their employees and families. Mike's commitment to delivering extraordinary member service experience, fostering mutually beneficial relationships, and humble, approachable style have grown BCU to more than 260,000 members in the US and Puerto Rico. So with that in mind, let's kick off with, since the uh, title of this webinar is How Ethical Leadership is the Key to Sustained Success in Business, let's start with this idea that there is a direct relationship or can be a direct relationship between ethical leadership and quantifiable benefits to a company, to its reputations, to its uh, employees and the people it serves. For example, last year at a keynote speech, an engineer in my audience uh, told a story in which he admitted to a client that he had made a serious mistake and that the deadline for the project was going to have to be pushed back several months. Now, he was really concerned that he might be fired for you know, mentioning uh, bringing this up, but uh, in, the client did not fire this engineer. Instead, the client said, I'll call him Jeff. Jeff, you are a person I can trust. Your honesty and courage make you the kind of person I want to do business with. So that client gave Jeff's company an additional contract, actually several additional contracts worth $3 billion. So here's one example of a direct relationship between honest and courageous conduct and a quantifiable financial benefit. So Carol, do you have a story like that uh, in the Intel Corporation you'd like to share with us? Well, sure. Good morning. Thank you so much for, for having me um, and having me talk about uh, ethical leadership, particularly on the eve of um, Global Ethics Day. So exciting topic and one that I'm passionate about. And just before I start, I need to make a disclaimer. Uh, the statements that I make are my own and don't reflect those of my company, uh, Intel, or any of its officers or employees. Um, but yes, I have a, a similar story, and it's really about taking accountability and responsibility, uh, responding promptly um, where there's an issue, um, and coming coming with solutions, right, for a particular client. And so there have been, um, generally, there have been uh, opportunities where um, we've gotten something wrong. Um, and when that happens, what we, what we do is we are transparent about what happened and how we're going to fix the issue. What we truly believe in is that relationships are about trust. And in business where enterprise dollars um, can be spent anywhere, we know that um, you know, Intel is given our footprint, given our size, um, an extraordinary important player in the marketplace. We know that trust and longstanding trust with our with our customers and clients are important. Um, and so there is 
the willingness to be accountable for what we do, our results, good and bad, and be very responsive. Thank you, Carol. How about you, Terry? Do you have a story like that? Um, sure. Yeah. And, and, you know, Bruce, let me let me mimic a couple of things that Carol shared. Um, first of all, thank you for the host for putting this together and allowing me to talk about one of my favorite subjects, ethics. And, you know, also, I have a disclaimer, anything that I say are my personal thoughts and not those of Otis. Um, and I think the important thing here, Bruce, is that each time an employee speaks up, they're taking an active role in building the ethical culture of the organization. And that's a direct benefit to that corporation and to every single employee that works there. Um, you know, it's it's an employee when they speak up, they are empowered and they're showing their commitment to integrity. And, you know, the way the organization responds to that is to also show integrity. And that's that's all the fabric of the ethical culture of the organization. Thank you, Terry. How about you, Mike? Thanks, Bruce. And again, uh, honored to be on this panel with these distinguished uh, uh, speakers. And Bruce, thanks again for the invitation. As I look at this, I, I think I build on, on Carol and Terry. And to me, it's about you do make mistakes, you will make mistakes. And I love the idea Carol gave of transparency, but it is how you react to these mistakes. You know, um, I, I think of myself growing up as a child, and, you know, if, if you went in and you did something wrong and you got screamed at, yelled at, you know, you're going to react differently. You may not be as transparent next time you make a mistake. And I think it's all about that reaction of how you have of saying, all right, this is a learning moment. Now, if it continues to happen, that's a different thing. But you need to learn from this. And it's all about the reaction that I think is so important to any type of a, of, of a situation where you do have, you know, unethical behavior. You know, Mike, it's funny that you say that because when I was looking at the evaluations after that talk, several people, and these were senior leaders at um, a private company who had gathered uh, uh, in this uh, annual convention, they'd never heard Jeff's story, but after hearing it, there, several people wrote in the evaluations, this gives me the, it, take, it lets me off the hook and, and I feel the next time I make a mistake, I'm not planning to, but if I do, I'm going to follow Jeff's lead and, and do what he did. So it, just as uh, people who are in a bad mood tend to tend to spread that negativity around, uh, people who do the right thing, like the folks you've described and, and Jeff in that example, uh, inspire others to do the same. And not only, as, as all three of you have said, not only is there no fault in admitting that you made a mistake, that we made a mistake, but the fault would be in not admitting it. And that, uh, so do you find, I'll start, uh, go back to you, Carol, do you find that in, in your own life, professionally and personally, that um, colleagues, friends of yours, maybe yourself, that um, admitting a mistake is actually a sign of strength, not weakness? Uh, absolutely. There, we, we can't actually grow and win in the marketplace unless we know where their issues are. And it, it takes an incredible amount of courage for employees to admit when something's wrong or admit that they actually see something. They may not know if it's a violation of a code, a violation of a policy, but there needs to be an open environment where people feel comfortable um, sharing bad news as fast as good news. And when you have that type of culture, you can actually fix problems on the front end and protect those individuals who come forward. So absolutely, I think it is imperative for us um, for it to have a sustainable business, long-term business, where we have trusted relationships with our employees, with our customers, to have in, in individuals who are willing to um, ask questions and then speak up when something seems wrong. So, Mike, why do you think that for so many of us, um, admitting a mistake feels like a sign of weakness rather than strength? Why, why is that? Well, I think I'd also go back, Bruce, to your original thing, and maybe I, I'm not putting it right. As you get experience, age, you know, maturity, I think it's easier to talk about some of these things. I think earlier in my career, it might have been harder for me to admit some of these mistakes because that, that was a sign of weakness. I think today's world learns so much from somebody being transparent. And you, you almost, you know, you don't turn an eye, but you go, wow, that was really courageous. You know, you admitted you, you made a mistake. And here's what the mistake is. So 
I think it's a lot to do with this era we're in right now and how the world's changing, you know, with how, how people's attitudes are towards mistakes and problems and issues that they're having. So if there were a, a greater attempt by corporations to cultivate stories like this, like the one that Jeff told, where he admitted that he made a mistake and instead of being fired, he was rewarded with $3 million of additional contracts. If people saw that that uh, ethical leadership, as difficult as it can be, can actually be a boon to the business. I wonder if that might be something that would not only build morale within the company, but actually could be parlayed into a PR or marketing campaign for a company so that actual or potential clients could say, hey, that's a company I wanna do business with, with people like Jeff. Harry, could you see something like that happening at Otis where where ethical leadership would actually, or perhaps it's already uh, occurred, where uh, stories like Jeff's could actually be part of a marketing or PR campaign? Yeah, you know, at Otis, we have what, call, what we call uh, Otis Does the Right Thing campaign, where we recognize employees who, when faced with ethical dilemmas, you know, responded in the, in the ethical way and exercised integrity. And we celebrate those stories. We celebrate those who come forward and, and tell us their stories. Um, you know, I made a mistake early in my career and I went to the attorney. I had mistakenly called the plaintiff's attorney rather than the co-defendant's attorney to tell them something we found out about a plaintiff in an investigation. Um, you know, gave away our defense. Uh, went to the attorney I was working for, and he, he taught me something that I've carried with me, that, you know, he said, first of all, thank you. You're working. You wouldn't be working. I know you're working because you made a mistake. You know, it's, they go hand in hand. You know, we're not mistake-free individuals. Um, but the important thing was, is that I went to my supervisor, shared that story so that we could work together for a solution. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, recognizing employees who come forward at Otis and doing the, you know, Otis does the right thing campaign. And, you know, it's great to share those stories. It's great. And what we've been talking about so far is when we ourselves make a mistake and whether or not we have the courage to admit it. But what about, since whistleblowers are so much in the news, this is not going to be a, a political discussion at all. But since we're talking a lot about the, the, the courage of the whistleblowers to come forward, I wonder if what's been happening in the news at your company um, might have a chilling effect on people who observe wrongdoing and might be reluctant to speak out because they see what's happening. Terry, uh, oh, actually, Mike, let, let's start with you on that one. Sure. Um, you know, you, you can't, you know, um, turn on the TV, read the newspaper, not see something going on with whistleblowing. But to me, and, and I, I, I think it's the right way to kind of look at this, I'd love to get to the point in our, in, in our culture, in our credit union, you know, that we have a culture that you don't need a, quote, whistleblower because people are taking care of it prior to that. They're comfortable enough to have a conversation with their manager, their supervisor, and go right up the chain with that. So to me, I, I think it's embracing this. And, and again, I go back to my original statement. It's how you react to these things that's so important. You know, you obviously, you can't, no retaliation, anything like that, but you wanna create that culture that people can do the right thing, as Terry said. And to me, Bruce, you know, I think it's, a, it, it's, it's unfortunate that you gotta get to the whistleblower, that that couldn't have been handled the right way through the right channels, you know, and, you know, instead now, you know, it's, it's, it's national news on what they're trying to do, but okay. that's, I digress, that's different. So, Carol, what about at Intel? <laughs> what have you seen there? Yeah, I think the this starts with tone at the top and the culture that's created from the top of the organization. And there, there are a couple of things that have stuck with me from our senior leaders. One, our CEO consistently says, if it's not done with integrity, it's not worth doing. So in every significant presentation, you hear that message and you hear that message loud and clear and it resonates globally um, throughout all of our sites and all of our offices. There's another senior uh, leader who has said, I never, I never lose. I either win or I learn. 
And it goes back to the storytelling. So when you actually learn something, you're making a mistake and you're being vulnerable and sharing that. And when you have senior leaders sharing when they were engineers and what they did and how they dealt with pressure and how they dealt with mistakes and what they did, either rightly or wrongly and how they learn from it, that actually opens up the culture and other people to feel comfortable, just as you said with your opening story, um, to share um, what they're experiencing and to share and ask questions. So really for me, it's tone at the top and then tone at the middle and how that actually permeates throughout the organization. It's so funny you say that, Carol, because mm -hmm. what comes to mind is a colleague and friend of mine named Jess Totfeld. Uh, and anytime I, I confide in him that something horrible has happened uh, in, in my career, he'll say, you have a great story now to tell people. And it's true. And in fact, I find that telling these stories actually humanizes me. And especially for those of us who are in, in the ethics business, so to speak, um, there, there might be a tendency to be self-righteous or to be seen as being self-righteous. And I wonder if that's true in compliance as well. My wife and I joke she's in compliance in the financial services industry that when we walk into a room or a party, the conversation tends to stop. But by admitting or telling these stories, uh, then people who listen to it say, you know what, this person's no different from I and, and he or she has the courage to come forward. But what also comes to mind is when I spoke to the South Carolina National Guard and presented a story in which uh, imagine you observe a violation of confidentiality in a public place, what's the right thing to do? And one of the members of the guard raised his hand and said, this is not a dilemma for us because it's very clearly specified in our code of conduct. If we do not report this, we can be, and we will be dismissed from the guard. So uh, Mike at, at BCU, um, how do people respond um, if they observe wrongdoing? How would you expect them and hope that they would respond if there is not a requirement to do something rather than nothing? Bruce, that's a good question. And, and I'd build on Carol's point, which I really like, and setting the tone from the top of the organization. But it's also webbed into our shared values, you know, the credit union, that we, that we act with integrity, we displace courage in our convictions, and we excel through collaboration, and we wow the members. So to me, it's living that. It's, it's doing that. So having that comfort that people can do that and will do that, and we do see that, you know, is it, a, is it perfect? No, but I think we're, we're really making headway, but it's kind of getting all employees rallied behind it. But I'd say, as Carol said, it starts from the top of the house and, and even our board of directors of how they look at it and say, Mike, you know, this is what we believe in and this is the way we're going to, we're going to handle these types of situations. And here's what it'll be. Outstanding. How about at uh, Otis, Terry? Yeah, I want to jump on something that, that Mike said, the tone at the top, and Carol made a reference to it too, is, is remembering the top is not always the top of the org chart. It's the top to every single individual person. Um, so everybody takes a, a top role, a leadership role when it comes to ethics. And, you know, something I always go back to is the think, ask, consult. And I think, you know, the ask is being able to talk to the leaders um, your personal leader, the leader of a department, leader of the company, with regards to the challenges that get faced, and being empowered to do so and have leaders that, that listen. And so I think it's, it's, it's an all-encompassing conversation that leads to, you know, solutions, ethical solutions. It's, it's outstanding. And uh, we have two uh, members of the compliance community and a CEO, and as I've gotten to know you, all this year, if I worked in your organizations and you were the person I had to report to, I would actually want to do the right thing rather than restrain myself from doing something else uh, because you, you command respect and I would want to honor my relationship with you. And, I, and, and no, none of you comes across as being demanding or potentially angry at people if, if they make a mistake, but you seem to me to welcome these kinds of behaviors. And I think it makes people want, it, it inspires people to want to do the right thing. So uh, you don't have to comment on that since I just paid you a compliment, but you're, you're free to if you want. Micah, do you find that <laughs> being approachable uh, tends to encourage people to do the right thing? 
Well, I do. And in fact, I even saw it um, yesterday in a situation where an employee is going to leave the company and um, and it was an employee that was probably four levels down from 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 me. But I took the time to sit down with that employee and have a conversation about what was going on, what was wrong. And it was it, it was something some co companies might say that's terrible. Let the manager lead that. But it's something that I would embrace and say, if we have a situation where people are leaving or people want to do something different, I want to hear from them. You know, I, I don't want to be insulated from that. And I want to hear in their words what they're seeing. And if there's things we can do to make things different, I want to be a part of that. It, it, it's wonderful. It really is wonderful. Uh, just to change the channel a bit now, I'd like to talk in, in broader terms about the purpose of your organization. So. Uh, you may recall that in January of 2018, uh, BlackRock Chair and CEO Larry Fink challenged other CEOs to make purpose as well as profit a cornerstone of their companies. And he said, quote, to prosper over time, every company must not only deliver financial performance, but also show how it makes a positive contribution to society, end quote. And the British Academy has called for something similar. This week, did you see this on Monday in the New York Times? There was an op-ed by the CEO of Salesforce, Mike Be Mark, uh, Mark Benioff, and he wrote, quote, capitalism as we know it is dead. It's time for a new capitalism, a more fair, equal, and sustainable capitalism that actually works for everyone and where businesses, including tech companies, don't just take from society, but truly give back and have a positive impact. So uh, let's start with Carol, since he's talking about tech and he's in tech. Uh, does your company support this idea? And if so, how? Well, I'll say this, and I'll, I'll go back to one thing that, that Mike said, just in terms of, of leadership. Um, first, le leading with fear doesn't work, right? It, it's really important to, when I think about leadership and I think about those individuals with whom I've had the privilege of working uh, side by side with or learning from, it's really about servant leadership, both setting a vision um, for your team, for your company, um, but also at times uh, following uh, if needed. Um, in terms of ethical leadership from an enterprise perspective, I would agree that um, we have a, both a, an obligation and a responsibility um, as ethical companies um, to try to do the right thing. And that isn't necessarily always easy. It takes um, really living your core values and being very clear about what those core values are and how you can influence those within your supply chain, how you can influence your employees. And so um, ethical leadership from an enterprise perspective, a company perspective, given um, the size and the breadth of our companies and our employees, it is about every day figuring out what is the right thing to do and what's the right thing where we can add differentiated value for our, our customers in an ethical and legal way everywhere we do business and how we can influence those with whom we work, our business partners, to do the same. Wonderful. Terry, what about Otis? Does it buy into this idea that a corporation should be about purpose as well as profit? Yeah, you know, you know, Otis, and, and I'm proud to be part of a, a company that, you know, we're, we make products that and services that make modern life possible. We allow cities to grow taller, we move people. Um, and I'm proud to be part of a global company that is, you know, helping with the industrial growth of, of our world. But, um, you know, I think the giving back and finding purpose in what we do and inspiring others to do the same by living by absolutes, Otis absolutes are safety, ethics, and quality. And, you know, living by those absolutes, being a steward of an ethical uh, corporation that holds integrity at its forefront. And, you know, I think overall that provides, um, you know, citizens of all cultures with something to gravitate towards um, and, and to aspire to. Thank you, Terry. Now, Mike, the structure, the financial structure of a credit union is different from a for-profit corporation. So um, could you talk a little bit about what that difference is and also uh, the extent to which you buy into what Larry Fink and Mark Benioff are talking about in terms of the new capitalism? I, I 
I thought that was very refreshing, Bruce. And, and as a credit union, we're a 501c nonprofit organization. And with that, that gives us certain flexibilities. And I call it, you know, I think the group is doing a good job of purpose driven. We're here today for your tomorrow. And we really live it every day. And remember, when you're holding people's money, I don't think there's anything more sacred that people have than their money. So you want to make sure that you're acting as ethically, as purpose driven as you possibly can. And I always say for us, and it's it served us well, and I've, I've been in my job for 35 years, it's a lot to do with you do the right things and the outcome might be profit, the outcome might be growth, but you're doing the right thing and your employees are rallying behind that, that you can get that. But it all starts with me, with our employees, with our purpose, which is here today for your tomorrow, to drive that. And when you are a nonprofit, now you can't be for loss, by the way, but you're a nonprofit. You you can do some things that some of the profit orientated. We're not focused on earnings per share. We're not focused on certain things that others are. But what we are focused on is really creating that member experience when people deal with us, that they come out and they feel good about that experience and whatever that might be. Well, so here's the thing. Um, I've devoted my life to teaching ethics around the world. And what I've discovered is that for many people, a discussion about ethics is about as appealing as having dental surgery. Um, and I, I've thought a lot about this, and I, I, it seems to me that the reason is because ethics strikes a lot of folks as something that we should take seriously, that we ought to buy into, but we'd rather not because it's focused on doing something for other people that we might not want to do. Um, as opposed to looking at ethics more broadly, as, as you've been talking about, as being something beneficial to all of us. So, Carol, why do you think there's so much resistance to the idea of ethics in business? And what is one thing that um, people watching this could do to overcome that? Well, I think, as you said, um, the concept of ethics has a stigma associated with it that we are the you know, the do right police, right? That we're the body of no, um, and, and co that conjures up any uh, image that 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 you may think of, right? From the movies, you know, what's the villain? Well, that might be the ethics person, right, in your office. And I think we need to change the narrative about ethics as being um, to the side of business, right? Or when something goes wrong, how do you remediate and how do you cure? Um, but ethics has to be part of your business practices. It's designed in and built in, not strapped onto how you conduct business, how you think about making business decisions. Because I, I think about ethics as a business imperative. So have it changing the narrative within your company about the value of ethics and how that can actually help you with innovation, help you bring diversity of ideas to the forefront help you act and with, with velocity um, to deliver uh, products and solutions for customers um, that, that add a tremendous amount of value. So I think it's changing the narrative um, and having those open discussions that are embedded into uh, discussions about your finances and discussions about you know, your quarterly, um, your outcome. Uh, and, and that's the way in which you, you embed ethics into the everyday business conversations. Thank you, Carol. How about you, Terry? Why such resistance to ethics in business? You know, I think because historically, I mean, there is that connection that ethics and compliance officers are hall monitors, um, you know, the ones trying out, the, out there to, to find the wrong, you know, and that's not what it's about. Um, it, it's about, you know, ethics and compliance officers are, are a place to go for resource, for guidance, to talk it out, you know, that thing gas consult that I was talking about. Um, and what we're doing here today, we're talking about ethics. That's what, you know, the role of anybody in ethics and compliance is about, is talking about those challenges and dilemmas and moving away from the historical thoughts and moving towards, you know, ethics and compliance, we're resources, we're guidance. Yeah, there's rules we have to work by, whether it's our internal policy, laws, regulations, and they all get complicated. Let's face it, they're long. I mean, regulations are volumes. Um, and it, it's, it's talking together so that you can reach a decision. We're, we're here to help. 
by the way, for anyone watching this who is tasked with having to give an ethics presentation or teach ethics within the organization, I'm happy to, to share with you, to send you a copy of an article I wrote called How to Teach Ethics and Still Have People Like You. Because uh, <laughs> let's face it, this can be the driest topic around. And my wife told me about when she went to an ethics presentation at her bank, and the the whole presentation was the presenter just reading a list of regulations that she could have read on her own. I mean, the, the absolute worst way to teach, not just ethics, but anything. So one, of course, one important aspect of ethics today is diversity inclusion. And I'd be keen uh, to hear how your organization promotes and enforces and welcomes uh, a diversity of voices. Mike. Uh, Bruce, that's a, a great start, and it kind of builds off the, you know, when we talk about ethics, and I love the hall monitor. There's some great analogies that are in there, but Fantastic. diversity inclusion, I think this is something that I have to say we're learning from our children. We're learning from the millennials, the Gen Zs. They're looking for organizations that do a better, are out for the better good you know, that are doing something aspirational. What, what does that look like? And a lot of times with companies, it's finding that balance. But what I think is so important with diversity and inclusion is, you know, for us, we have 260,000, you know, members of the credit union. We've got to look like our members. You know, we, we've got to really make a conscious effort to say, what does that look like? But I also think it's, it's, it's also diversity of thought. You know, so many times I say, if, if there's if there's three of us in a meeting, we all agree, and they all say, tell Mike what he wants to hear, then I don't need them. You know, we, we need to be speaking freely. We need to be able to have that and encourage that type of thing. But to me, diversity, you know, really starts from the top. I think it's it's like a lot of things. You know, it's in one of my, my performance measures from my board of directors. You know, what are we doing in this? And it, it really starts in our recruiting. You know, how, how how wide are we going, you know, when we look for people? And remember, at our company, we have a lot of referrals from employees. Well, guess what? They look like employees. You know, if they're referring them, they're, they look and, and think a lot like that versus are we really going out and trying to make an effort to try to get a diverse slate of candidates? And I'd say only within the last couple of years, we've really done a good job with that. And we're starting to change the scenery in the credit union, which I, I think is the right thing to do. But there's so much more that, that comes with this that people just have to start thinking. It, it needs to be more than ethics. It needs to be more than diversity inclusion. You need to really act it out. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Mike. Carol, what about at Intel? Yeah, I think about diversity in two ways. Uh, first, absolutely diversity of thought. And to piggyback on what Mike said about hiring, we, we look for people in all different types of places because we want people who are energetic, um, enthusiastic, but have integrity, right? The, the first two without the latter is a problem. Um, and so we look for people in a variety of places um, who are innovative, who can bring different viewpoints because we, we all have a story and that story is different and it's unique and it's informed by where we grew up and how we grew up and how we think about the world and how we interact with data and information. And those are the voices that we want to hear um, and to help bring innovation, right, to what we're delivering for our customers. Then the second way I think about diversity and inclusion is really about um, the leadership of this company. And uh, several years ago, I think it's 2015, um, our then CEO stood up at the at CES, the Consumer Electronics Show, and made a commitment, publicly uh, made a commitment that Intel would uh, reach full representation of underrepresented minorities and women by 2020. And if you know Intel, we are, uh, if there's a challenge and if it's hard, uh, we think we can do it and we continue to do it. And so we um, really focused uh, on achieving that uh, goal and that objective and that commitment and achieved it within uh, two years earlier, right, than that commitment. So, so 2018, achieve full representation. And so that is, to Mike's point, making sure that your organization uh, looks like the world. Right. And we, we are a global company um, in multiple countries with you know, different microcultures. And it is when you work for Intel or when you work for a company, what are the core values that you want to exhibit? And you want to bring in people and then retain people um, that exhibit those values. Wonderful. Terry, what about you? Right. Drawing upon what both Carol and Mike said, you know, hiring diverse 
talent is, is an important piece of it, but it's not the only piece. It's making that diverse talent um, feel they belong once they have joined the organization. And the way we do that is acknowledging and recognizing our differences. And because of our differences, we're stronger and better. Um, you know, I'm thrilled to work with 68,000 employees around the globe and any given day I can be speaking with somebody in China or Middle East or Russia um, and recognizing the, the differences in language, writing style, um, values, the way they think of things um, is so valuable. And I think when we embrace the diversity, make a inclusive environment, um, you know, we are stronger. <laughs> I agree, and it turns out there's some very simple ways all of us, uh, things we can do to promote diversity and inclusion in ways that we might not even be aware. So for example, how many times have you gone to a conference and PowerPoint after PowerPoint, the faces all look the same? They're all the same kind of person from the same kind of culture. And it turns out that you know if you go to Shutterstock, I I'm not uh, shilling for them, that's just the company that I used to get images for my PowerPoints, you can get a range of uh, cultures represented in, in slides. So this could be one very simple thing all of us can do immediately to promote diversity and inclusion by simply making our presentations more reflective of the audiences that we're speaking to. So as we uh, come to the end of this, it's gone way too fast. Um, I always like to end with a call to action. You know, one specific thing that somebody can do immediately to put one of these lessons into practice because it's great to hear these these wonderful lofty thoughts and and it always inspires me to hear people like you talk about how you're making ethics come alive at a, at a company but for in terms of the person watching this what is one thing they can do uh, to promote ethical leadership in their own professional or personal life what about you mike I, uh, I I keep thinking uh, there's a, a mentor of mine, uh, Harry Kramer, who's the former CEO of Baxter Healthcare. And one of the things he always said, which I live by every single day, is if it's going to be posted in Forbes magazine, um, how would you feel? You know, um, will you will you look at that and say I'm proud of that? You know, and it, by the way, it's not always the right decision of what you're doing, but you you you're it's rooted with the right uh, background and you've got the right uh, input to make those decisions that you can do it. But my thing is always, if that thing's posted in the, in the magazine of Forbes, how would you react? I think I always try to lead people with that and even the people that work for me to say, hey, are you going to be proud of that? Would you say that in uh, our digital era that in addition to trying to avoid headlines in a newspaper or magazine that we might also think about how it might look on social media when it becomes a meme? Is that something that we could also think about in terms of the consequences of what we do? Well, is that not true? You know, these days, and I think it's really hard, and I, and I go back to our, 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 I would say my children, you know, and, and I look at, you know, how they've grown up and the environment that they've been, that social media is so important. But just remember, I don't, and I'm sure the other, you know, Intel and Otis does the same things. A lot of times when you're interviewing candidates, you can't help to look at their social media. You can't help to look at, at their LinkedIn. And boy, you can learn a lot and you need to really look what's on there and what you're posting on there. Is that really represent you, you know, as a person? But I, I well said, Bruce. I think that's a great point. Thank you so much, Mike. What about you, Terry? What's one takeaway that someone could put into action right away? I think one takeaway that they can do is not looking up for who the ethical leaders are, but looking within themselves. Each one of us is an ethical leader to somebody and recognizing that. And, you know, we've heard the phrases, talk the talk, walk the walk, but each one of us lays out a path for others to follow. And when they see that you're carrying on in an ethical, integrity manner with integrity time over time they're going to know they're in an ethical environment and mimic those behaviors well i think the takeaway i would have is everybody you're an ethical leader what are you going to do about it i love it and we don't i think it's true for a lot of folks that when we hear the word leader we think of someone else someone else in the company someone else in the society yeah, but we're all up. leading our lives we're all for better or worse we're all leading our lives and and 
think reframing it could actually right. promote a stronger commitment to ethical leadership, as you say, Terry. What about you, Carol? Yes. Well, well, well said, uh, both Mike and Terry. Uh, just to piggyback, I, I would say it's really leading by example and thinking about you know what what your narrative is going to be. Um, thinking about what what are your parents going to say? What, what would they say if they found out about a particular decision? Um, not only what your peers, right, or, or coworkers, uh, or friends would would think, but think about the why you're um, motivated, what motivates you, why you're making decisions that you make, and think about the optics of those decisions, uh, because you will be judged in hindsight about what you do and why you did it. Um, and um, having a, really starting from your values um, and making decisions that are value driven. Um, will 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 help you make the right decision no matter what that is down the road. It's wonderful, and with all the ethics training that companies are doing, as you suggest, Carol, maybe it comes down to wanting to honor our parents. Uh, for me, whenever I'm torn with in a moral dilemma, which is probably every hour, I think I hear my dad or my mom's voice saying, "Either do that or don't do that, or you'll embarrass me or don't humiliate me." And you know, in spite of all the training I've had, it, it really comes down to relationships with parents and, and, and teachers, I suppose, as well, right? We've all had moving teachers, powerful and inspirational teachers from elementary school who still stay with us. So um, in the final moment, I'd just like to hear from each of you, since you've taken time out of your day to talk about this, why are you personally invested in ethics? Why do you personally care so much about ethical leadership. Terry? You know, it starts at an early age, Bruce. You you lived in a household of, it sounds like, rules. Um, my parents were teachers, so I lived in a learning experience household. We, we took family vacations to museums. Um, and, uh, you know, it was always about list out the pros and cons. Think about it. Get other people's input and then come to your decision. Um, and that, that I've taken my whole life. Um, and they've, I think that upbringing made me passionate about ethics forever. Thank you, Terry. What about you, Carol? Well, you know, this is a, it's a little bit, a little bit of a strange story, but um, for me, ethics, and I never thought about it in this way when I was seven or eight, uh, but it really came down to doing the right thing um, for yourself and for others. So my father uh, worked two jobs uh, and grew up in the Midwest. Uh, my mother was a teacher and uh, my father on the way um, home from picking me up from, uh, I think it was soccer practice or some other sporting activity I was involved in, you know, saw a, a child waiting for the, a bus and he had shoes on that were flapping so the soles were, were undone. Um, and at this time, you could actually pick up a child and take them home without, you know, <laughs> the police following you or that type of thing. And so I remember him pulling over and, and talking to the kid and and uh, and and taking taking him and getting shoes, right? Um, and, and and then drove him home. And so uh, I, I remember talking to my father about that, and he said, you know, we we have an obligation to serve one another and to help one another and to respect one another and, and to do what we can. And that I think has stuck with me as I've moved um, you know, in my career and thinking about how do I help businesses do the right thing, um, how employees do the right thing and have a, a voice um, and how we respect one another. So that's why I'm passionate, so passionate about ethics. I love it. Thank you so much for that. Mike, how about you? I think, you know, and, and we build on, on Carol and Terry, Bruce, as I see it, I have, you know, to me, it's the example, you know, and for me as a leader of an organization has 700 employees and serve 260,000 members, you have to set the example. And it's a must. There, there's no choice that's given to this. And I think the only way I like to do things is embrace it, you know, and that transparency that people will see and you hope it gets contagious. Outstanding. Thank you. So I wish we had three more hours for this and perhaps in the future we will. But uh, thank you for joining us for this webinar on Global Ethics Day. I'd like to thank the Carnegie Council, the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants, and the CFA Institute for their support. Thank you also to our wonderful guests, such inspiring people, Carol Tate from Intel, Terry Civitello from the Otis Elevator Company, and Mike Valentine from Baxter Credit Union. This is Bruce Weinstein, the Ethics Guy. If you have any questions about anything you've seen or heard, 
feel free to write to me at theethicsguy.com. I'd be happy to send you that article on how to teach ethics and still have people like you. And we are so grateful that you spent a portion of your day with us today. See you next year. Thanks so much.